Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the gospel reading from Mark chapter 6. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, our reading ended with Jesus sending out his disciples two by two, giving them authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick and to proclaim that people should repent. The time has come because the living and active reign of God is now at hand in Jesus. The time to repent of their sins has come because the one with the power to forgive those sins, to bring healing for those sins, has finally come. But Mark doesn't take us on the journey with the disciples to see the beauty and wonder of lives being changed and people being healed as they in counter the kingdom of God. He doesn't take us along to see how the word had its impact, that there were people who were hospitable to what the disciples were preaching and receiving them into their homes. He doesn't bring us to see any of that. No, instead, Mark takes us somewhere else entirely. He puts us in the middle of a story that leaves us wondering why in the world something like this is happening now that the kingdom of God is near. You know, in these first few chapters of Mark's gospel, Jesus has spent quite a bit of time teaching his disciples and others that the kingdom of God is not what you think it is. Like how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that, that transforms from the tiniest of seeds to the largest plant in the garden. Or how it's like a seed planted in the ground that sprouts and grows even when we know not how. The kingdom of God is often not what we think it is. And usually unfolds in ways and in situations that leave us scratching our heads. Like in the story that Mark does take us into this morning where we see firsthand how in the midst of all that seems hopeless, God reaches in and through the brokenness and the mess and makes his glory known. The disciples have gone out on mission, proclaiming that people should repent of their sins because the kingdom of heaven has come near in Jesus. And that message eventually reaches King Herod. I mean, he's not exactly a king, he's kind of a partial king, a, a tetrarch, one of four other rulers. You know, his family is a, as corrupt as they come. Their loyalty is given to whomever gives them power and prestige. They seek after pleasure when and however it can be found, regardless of whose lives may be trampled over in the process. And as the word of God is being preached, as the disciples are telling people about Jesus, this horrible story comes out. You know, others are speculating as to who this Jesus is and how it is that he's able to do all of these incredible things. And people have these questions. Who is he? Maybe he's Elijah. Maybe he is one of the prophets of old. But Herod... Herod has his own guilt-driven guess. Well, obviously, this is John the Baptist, the guy I beheaded, and now he's back from the dead. Now, Herod didn't kill John because of what he was saying. He killed him because a teenage girl asked him to, because her mother asked her to ask for that. Because she didn't like what John had been saying about the sin of marrying her husband's brother. And Herod didn't have the spine to go back on his offer to this girl who had brought him so much pleasure through dancing, even if it meant doing something so barbaric to someone that he once felt the need to protect. Someone that perplexed him, but someone that ultimately he was glad to listen to. 
And we see the mess of all of this, and it's easy for us to wonder, what's the purpose of this story? Why does Mark take us on such a dark and twisted journey down Herod's memory lane? I mean, this is one of those stories that you don't typically bring up in, say, polite conversation. Along with other things like your brother's arrest, your dad's fifth marriage, or your own struggle with pornography. I mean, this story is one of those things. It's not fit for polite conversation. It's not easy to talk about or listen to, but maybe, maybe that's the problem. See, the kingdom of God is not built on polite conversation. It's built on the reality that God works in a fallen world. And sometimes that work can be messy. And it involves people and places and things that we don't like to think about. We read something like this and are reminded of just how messy the work of redemption can be. That yes, while disciples are going out and proclaiming and having success, this is also happening. But God has come to save people from sin, real sin. And and real sin is is often not the stuff that we like to talk about, which is why it is so good to have a story like this read and a church like this on Sunday morning. It reminds us how God works. There's a reason that, that Mark positions this story where he does in his gospel. And first, Mark wants us to know that the preaching of the kingdom will awaken real guilt, real sin in the lives of real people. That's what the Word of God does. It points it out. It it reveals that which we are trying to hide, that which we are trying to forget about, that which we are trying to move on from and pretend as though it didn't happen. But God's word brings it back to us and makes it real. And sometimes we forget that we, our faith is actually about real things, real people, real situations. Sometimes Christianity can become a teaching that we just simply agree with the, a confirmation class that we pass as we learned information or a set of motions that we go through and we forget the reality of faith, that our faith has actually released us from horrible sin into a life of holiness that we never knew existed. Because our God is a living God and he uses his word to awaken our conscience to sin, real sin, committed by real people in a world which is really fallen. See, the memory of Herod's banquet gone bad, his feast of foolishness, is dark and depraved. The things that people would even consider doing But how far would one have to go into our lives, into our thoughts, into the memories of our actions before they start to get uncomfortable? And we know that apart from Christ, (laughs) there is no end to the evil that humans are capable of. But, But even in Christ... We have had times where we have struggled and fallen. We are at the same time saint and sinner, and sometimes we forget how bad that sinner can be and how real that sinner can be and how easily the church can become this place where you don't talk about those things, where you keep them buried and cover them with the knowledge of your forgiveness. But that's not what Christianity is. Faith is more than just knowledge. Faith experiences sorrow for sin, real sin. I mean, just as faith also experiences the joy of forgiveness, real forgiveness from the one who comes to save sinful people like us. And though our sins may not seem to fit 
and polite conversations. They certainly belong to holy conversations. The sort of conversations that we have with God where we actually name our sins with full transparency, without defense, where we put everything on the table because we know that redemption is messy. Our redemption is messy. Where there's the conversations that we have with our pastor during private confession and absolution, where the Word of God has stirred our hearts and awakened us to the evil that we've done and what we've thought, and we become vulnerable before another human being as we share those real sins and our pastor offers real forgiveness, or those conversations you have with another brother or sister in Christ as you share it with one another that you had that common experience, that you've shared in that common struggle and you know what it is to be there and you also can point one another to where there's real hope. This is what Christianity is. It's faith that is connected to reality, real sin with real forgiveness. Now, those are not polite conversations, but they are real conversations. Sure, they can be awkward, but they are also holy. They are conversations that recognize that redemption is messy. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he wrote a letter to Timothy. And he told Timothy, hey, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of a full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Or as he wrote in his letter to the Ephesian Christians that we heard just earlier, where he says, in Christ we have redemption through his blood. Through blood. I mean, redemption is messy. The blood of Jesus is messy, but it's real, it's holy, and it brings real forgiveness, and it is for you. There's another thing that I think Mark shows us as he places this story in the middle of his disciples going out on mission. And I think it's that that Mark wants us to know that Mission itself is messy. In fact, sometimes it, it's deadly. And John died proclaiming God's word. He didn't soften the truth for the sake of his powerful audience or out of fear of what they could do. No, he proclaimed the word until he couldn't. His calling was to prepare the way for Jesus, to point people to who Jesus is and what he has come to do. And even in death, John continues pointing to Jesus. There his body lays lifeless, his blood shed, pointing to what would happen one day to Jesus, pointing to the Lamb of God who has come into this world to take away real sin from real people by shedding real blood. The one who is mightier than John would come into this mess because mission is messy in the kingdom of God. And Jesus' own disciples would eventually learn this as they learn what it means to pick up their crosses and follow Jesus. Mission is messy, but God works in the midst of mess, even when we cannot see it, even when we're tempted to question and wonder, what is going on here? How how could this be part of God's plan? How could God be at work in this? And there, he somehow still shows us. See, there's a reason that seeds grow down in the soil, or why babies grow in the womb. There are things about the beginning of life that are hidden to human eyes. There's a mystery to it. God's work is often mysterious. You know, the Spirit's work of awakening people's hearts and minds, when it happens, how it happens, it all happens underneath the surface, hidden from human eyes, underneath layers of sin and darkness and mess. And speaking of mess, 
What could possibly show the messiness of mission more than the cross of Jesus? Where he bears God's real wrath for our real sin, where his innocent blood is shed for our sinful mess, where this seed of Adam is buried in the ground and hidden from human eyes, descending into the depths of depravity and messiness of hell. Because God works in the mess, conquering sin, conquering death, and rising again to show us real life. The seed eventually becomes that first fruit of the new creation, crying out to us, out of this mess, you too will rise. I think it's fitting, as Mark shares with us, what Herod's reaction is to all that's going on on the mission of Jesus as the word is being proclaimed and he's seeing all these things. And Herod's response, his immediate reaction is what? He thinks that this Jesus guy is actually the resurrected John. Now, we've called Herod a lot of things and we've seen how terrible he can be, but it's interesting that even here in this terrible story, Herod is a prophet. Because the day is coming when John will rise again. And when the disciples who picked up their crosses and followed after Jesus into death will rise again. When you and I and all who have received real forgiveness for real sin will rise again. Because God works in the mess. So perhaps it's not that strange to have this story read in church this morning. You know, we are people who have been saved from real sin and who are not afraid to talk about it. We have been set free from the boundaries of what is polite to pursue what is holy. Why? Because our Savior, our King, is here in our mess, inviting us into His feast, into His kingdom that has no end. It's a king who gives us his word, and it is a word that doesn't kill us, but a word that ultimately gives us life, and it is a word that does protect us and keep us safe. It is a word that we can count on all the way to the end, where we'll get to live and serve him in his kingdom, which will have no end. Yes, redemption is messy, and mission is messy, But in the midst of all that seems hopeless, God reaches in and through the brokenness and the mess, and he always makes his glory known. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.